the aim is to do something about making wall plaques, uh, which are basically bowls by another name, uh, but just designed so that you can hang it on the wall. This is one piece of cedar of Lebanon. Um, uh, there's nothing absolutely magical about them, other than the fact that they look quite nice on the wall. You don't often get a big piece of wood. One of the aims is to actually laminate one up and uh, try and do it that way. Um, so, textured, coloured, fiddled with. So, um, by the way, the hole was deliberate to show it's battle scarred, as are the slits that are being filled. It's true. Uh, if you do look at it, please don't drop it because I can't replace the wood. I'll come back to you, Rhett. Uh, so, uh, this is a little one. I can come a bit closer because it might be easier for you. Uh, thank you. This is a little one, the style of which I might well be trying to do tonight. Um, it, texturing wheel of different types on the back. Quite a lot of people seem to struggle with texturing. Uh, so we'd be trying to show a bit of that. Uh, carving, thumping and beating to make it look a bit like a, a medieval shield. Um, so it will be a bit like Blue Peter today, so that I'm making something and then doing something, and there may or may not be a bit of turning, depends on... Hold that for a minute. Thank you, sir. You can pass it around if you want. Uh, this is a little one. Uh, I think they don't have to be particularly big to make an effective... Uh, wall plaque, uh, just something you can hang on the wall. That's the definition of it. The colours at the back and the colours at the front don't really match. It was just because this was a, a test piece for today. So uh, that doesn't have to be an expensive piece of wood. Um, so that's the sort of idea. So, uh, yeah, great. So how do I go about doing one? Um, well, the turning isn't particularly magical, um, but I just wanted to show you something that I do use, which is, if you've got a, a lot of my wood is a bit gnarly, um, so I just have got a, a face plate, it's a rubbish face plate, there's a piece of kitchen door and it warped, so I stuck a few bits of wood on the back to make it flat. Um, so screw through it. Uh, it means that you can shove that on your uh, your headstock. And the first thing obviously you need to do is to turn tenons, uh, mortises. So part of the, the bit with turning any platter uh, like that is that you've got to have a mortise on both sides. Uh, so when I do that, I just whack it up, bring the center up. And you know where the center's going to be because you'll have done a center mark when you started to do the piece. And it's a very simple way of actually getting your piece sorted out. Obviously, you get a few, I'm not going to do that on here. You obviously got a few holes that are, are created as a result of doing it. So you have to um, get rid of those. But by adjusting the screw tips to be only two or three mil, the holes are quite small. So I don't know. Do you do that sort of thing? Uh, some people just do a grip face and just a pressure grip. But um, I find that if you've got a piece of wood that's not perfect on one side, you can still get a grip, even if it's a bit wobbly. So this is, this is what I've started. Uh, I mean, there are, there are two or three phases to doing it. First thing is get a mortise on both sides. So this is one that I've done the mortise on the one side, fairly obvious, just go down it with your parting tool. That's why they got the nub in the middle. Um, and then rechuck it. I'll turn a, another mortise on this side. The key thing with doing this is making sure that the size of your mortise is as accurately sized to your chuck jaws as you can make it. Because when you actually reverse it to do the detailing on the front and then the detailing on the back, at some point, the mortise won't be redressed. It'll be gripped and that'll be it. So you want it to be exactly the right size for a dovetail mortise, and then that way you won't get any marks. Particularly if you're coloring it, 
Right, I don't know how you mark your mortises. I do it the dangerous way. So if you do this, make sure that the far tip doesn't touch. A couple of little touch marks to find out where you are. And that's marked your mortise. Shove a parting tool in. pointy bit to it. Yeah, so I'm just going to do a bit of shaping on the outside. So about 1,200. Don't know what this wood is. I'm going from the inner side to the outside. I'm sure there's a lot of considered wisdom as to which is the best way to do it. But I think this uh, tends to give you the better finish. I'm certainly not going to be doing any sanding today. Uh, so, create a few little whimsies around here. I'm going to drop the mortise in a bit further. The jaws I've got on are the record powered deep, uh, deep dovetails, so you can actually allow quite a large boss in the middle uh, to be in existence without it snagging on the jaws. Uh, I can show you the jaws later. So they've got a big deep um, gap of about an inch. Normally if it's a shallow standard sea jaws and you do anything that's substantial, it bottoms out and you can't, you can't use it. So, just do some sort of little boss. Uh, just doing, doing a little sort of coat, little bead here, using the bowl gouge. Whether you can see that or not. And, uh, Sure. I think this is the dreaded poplar. It certainly feels like it. It's interesting where the knot is. It's it's got a heavier side, one side to the other side. Uh, So I've got a few little patterns there. Um, this depth is currently too deep. I know that it, it won't, um, won't sit properly on there. So I'm just going to reduce this a little bit. That's the knot that you can hear. Got to take a couple of mil off because I was a bit overly uh, exuberant with the uh, the depth of the tenon. And so there's no magic to this, so let's just do a little, a little covey thing. And then do something else over here, similarly. Just gives us some points of detail when you actually, if you choose to do some colouring on it, that you can uh, do some colour in different zones. Okay, so um, 
that or a ver version thereof can give you your basic platform for that side. Um, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, we'll yeah, just go to the to the other side. I've written practice on it. That's either a suggestion that I did practice or a suggestion that this was a piece to practice on, I'm not sure which. That hasn't quite gone on straight. See the advantage of having the mortise on both sides is you can now flip the work around. That's reasonably true. Um, so if this is the back, uh, then uh, it's quite good to end up with some texture on it. Um, this is going to hang on a nail on the dovetail. They hang quite successfully. You don't need to do anything fancy, no picture rail hangings or anything. Um, so just do a bit of tidying. So I'm going to leave this dovetail here because if the back and the centre, obvious, but if the back and the centre aren't at least flush, it won't, it will rock on the, um, on the wall. So if you're doing it, little thing, just make sure that you know that you're going to get a nail in there, particularly if you start off with a lumpy old bit. It's got some splits developing in it, so it won't be the most wonderful piece of stuff. So uh, it doesn't really matter what you want to do on the back, but it's still worth taking the effort because people do look. If you want it to be really lightweight, you hollow it all out. If you want it to feel a bit heavier, then just do some detailing. So when you're doing the texturing wheels, it's quite fun to have different different types of things, maybe some uh, sort of beads and coves and valleys and troughs because you get some different different detailing as a result with your with your texturing wheel. There's going to be texturing and there's going to be hitting and banging in due course and maybe a bit of carving too. I think the wall hanging is probably better if it's got a bit of weight to it. If you've got the, the meat on the piece then you might as well leave some of it as long as it's dry. Obviously if it's slightly green then you want to make sure that you treat it accordingly and make sure it's nice and thin otherwise it will split. Um, okay. So a little bit rough on there. Just do a little bit of a pull cut. None of this is magic, is it? It's just normal stuff. There's a little bit of a tool mark in there. Okay, I'll just dress the face, make sure the face is round probably moved since I <coughs> cut this a day or so ago. Now at this point you've got to decide whether you want a detail on the edge, don't want a detail on the edge. Now then, this is a little tiny, it's all right, little tiny beading tool. Uh, I'm never even sure what speed you're supposed to do it at, but I'm going to try and put a couple of little beads on, on the edge. The bevel of the tool is down. Uh, so uh, the main thing you've got to do is not use the crescent to reduce the size of the uh, bead. It's rather like screw... Uh, screw um, chasing, thread chasing, you don't take the top of the thread off with the tool. If you want to take, if you want to reduce it, you stop, take it off with a, a proper tool, 
and then uh, reset yourself. And it can be quite tricky to know when you're actually about to take it off or not about to take it off. So just go in slightly one side, slightly the other. So a little detail on the edge, just gives a bit of definition. Um, so we'll try a bit of texturing on, on this. So I've got a variety of texturing tools. So this is the Crown Mini. Uh, uh, there are different types of texturing wheels. Um, the ones I prefer to use are effectively the cog. So they've got a facet on one side and a flat and a sharp side on the other. You can get what they call texturing wheels. The, the crown one, I believe, comes from memory with the wheel I just showed you, which is whatever TPI it is, a slightly coarser one, uh, which again is beveled on one side and uh, flat on the other. You can buy the optional extra texturing tool, which is pointy on both sides. The, these ones are relatively fierce, even though they're small, uh, and I tend to rarely use it, personally. Uh, that's the Crown Mini. This is the Sorby Mini, same system, all by the shouting. Uh, the advantage is that the wheels are cheaper from the Sorby than they are for the Crown. Uh, so I bought a Sorby wheel to fit the crown. Um, these ones don't have a bearing in the middle. Most of you know this, but I'll, I'll, I'll just finish the spiel. They don't have a bearing in the middle. They have a brass bush. If you don't tighten the uh, brass bush up, they are in the shavings very rapidly and you have to hunt for them. Uh, when you address the tool to the piece, you would normally address the beveled edge which is a less aggressive cut. If you address the wood with the pointy edge, it's a more aggressive cut. So when you assemble the tool, assemble the knurled nut on against the flat side, so that when you actually address the tool, address the wood, the nut doesn't get in the way, because it will do. Um, that's the same for the two minis. This is the Sorby full size one. Uh, you can end up with the same TPI, pick a figure, 10 TPI. Uh, so you can end up with, um, and I'm not sure this is accurate, but you can end up with the same TPI, but on a smaller wheel as you do on this one, which can mean that you can end up with fairly similar patterns between the two. In much the same way, the full Sorby one comes with a variety of different cogs that you can get, uh, which are either finer or coarser. And then this one is also the one that's pointy on both sides. Um, the Sorby system is a bit of a pain in the ass because you've got three washers and you've got to get them in the right place. Uh, but it has got a bearing in it, which means it won't jam up. Uh, the Simon Hope system purportedly has hardened wheels, which you don't need to sharpen. Um, to sharpen this, all I do is eyeball where it is on the Pro Edge Get, the pro, get it sort of kissing the side of the Pro Edge and then let the Pro Edge spin. The wheel spins and it just abrades the face and gives it a little little nudge up on the, uh, on the edges. Um, then this is courtesy of Simon who accidentally ordered two over eBay. Um, so this is the uh, machinist's uh, eBay Chinese version in a homemade high-tech handle complete with woodworm, note the woodworm to prove that I'm a real man. Uh, um, so that's just been a hole rammed in, it's not even particularly straight. Um, this one comes, it wasn't very much was it from eBay, Simon? Um, and you've got a, a number of these, a uh, little harder to use because the body of the uh, tool kind of gets a little bit in the way, uh, but you can still use that quite effectively. I also use it to hit things with, which you'll see later on. Um, and then you've got the knurling tools 
uh, which come from Axminster. I don't think they sell them anymore, but you can get them from a variety of different places. Theoretically, these are metal work machinists ones. Um, and again, they don't have a bearing, don't think, fairly basic. Um, you ha they're not replaceable. Uh, you buy one at X TPI and then you buy another one at a different TPI. This is 16 TPI. And that gives you like a stippled pattern. So uh, I'll just uh, put that down. So yeah, we're going to be doing a bit of texturing and then I'm going to be doing a bit of different types of texturing. So uh, the thing that you all try and achieve if you can, and God knows if I can achieve it today, is a little flower in the middle, a little three or five uh, wing, little legged flower. Um, it, that can be quite tricky to do, may work today, may not. Um, when you're using these, I take all the guards off because they're useless, don't do anything. This one is still on there, but it's out of the way. Uh, um, you only really use them if you're trying to create a continuous pattern, a spiral like a candlestick spiral, in my view. Um, you need to get the tool on center so the handle can be slightly lifted. Um, if you're using the little one, that's I think about a thousand RPM. If you use the big one, it's about 500 RPM. So you eyeball where the center is, come slightly away from the center and you move the tool into the wood. And we'll see what happens. So it's just off vertical, just slightly at uh, sort of 1230, a little tiny, I'm gonna make it more like one o'clock, a little tiny distance away and hold it for about five seconds. Now I didn't get the cut, but it didn't bite. That's, that's biting. Two, three, four, that'll do. So my first attempt didn't bite and the net result is I've churned, I've churned a hole out. So I would clean that off and see if I can get a better one, uh, which I may not, because this wood is fairly nasty. The best wood is something like ebony where you get a nice, smooth, consistent grain. I'm gonna try the bigger tool because I think with this wood being as unpleasant as it is, that might give me a better start. So, turn the speed down to about 500. A little bit away. The key thing is to hold it still when you're doing the one in the middle. There you are. So, whether you can see that or not, possibly not, you've got a little Isle of Man swirl. Um, which obviously the little tool, I wasn't getting a good good bite on that. So texturing is just a question of wobbling the thing around. You open it one way, the spiral goes one way. You open it the other way, the spiral goes the other way. You keep it still, the spiral st spat pattern is static. You move it, the spiral moves with you. So I'm just going to plunge that in on the corner. Rotate it a little bit to the other way at about three o'clock. Nice firm push, come back the other way. And then go straight in. So again, that with you. Pardon me? Zoom's gone again. Well, at least the people in the hall can see something going on there, can't you? Um, the smaller tool Gives you smaller marks. That's a series of little tiny indentations. You can use the sharp edge. You've just got to watch where that little bearing is. And just put that in between some of the other marks that I've done. And that creates that little uh, individual pattern there. 
So, turn the speed up a little bit and try again with this one. So, when you get a uh, cove like this, uh, the tool, I can find the cog can jam or the cog can spin, depending on exactly how you, you've got pot luck as to how you get it in there. Uh, but I'm just going to approach that now into the base of that. And that, that's not spinning. Hmm. Come on. Try the big one. It obviously wasn't in contact with the wood enough and it was just digging in. Now, again, if you can see that, there's a swirl pattern around the side and because the wheel is catching, it's clear pattern, clear pattern. So, do you like it or not? Who knows? Uh, use the sharp edge. Got a nice strong pattern there. Uh, on the top of the cove. Another nice little stiffly pattern there. And then I'm going to pull, pull it out now, start at one point, get it running, and then move it slowly towards me. So that's now got a, a sort of sheared pattern, if you like. Um, use the knurling tool, run out of space almost to do this, but I'll just do a little little texture push in here. This one you've got to be quite firm. Because it's almost like bruising the wood rather than cutting it. And if you can see there, you've got a fairly pleasant little pattern around the edge. So all of that, with whatever colour choices you want, uh, can produce some really quite nice um, visible textures. Uh, what I would normally do is now use the very first tool that I had within the first three months of self-teaching was my 3 8 spindle gouge, which I snapped deliberately in order to create a handy point tool. Uh, so the key thing is, if I'm going to make some marks, I need to see them, and in this light it's a bit iffy. So I'm just going to use a pencil so I can see where I want to make some defining marks. Uh, so if you actually want to separate out the zones, it's quite good to just use a point tool and make some little... Sorry, I can't see. Push it in, twist it either side. It's got a sharp, sharpened facet. So it creates a, a cut groove rather than one that's, um, one that's uh, fluffy. And another little one here. Move it a bit left, a bit right. It cuts on the facets. So you've got a bit of definition there. Now that'll all be fluffy at this point, so you'd need to denib it with some um, NIWEB. Uh, you can choose to colour that uh, as, you, as you wish. We'll do a bit of colouring after the break, but I'm just going to now move on to doing something on the other side. Indexing pin. Anybody ever used indexing on this thing? No. Okay, so we can't do indexing on this today, fine. So let's just pretend that we're doing indexing because this is, uh, so I would normally want to mark this out into about eight panels. So I'm just going to do one because we can't index. Um, so if I'm going to do some different texturings in here, I'll try and break it up into some zones. So although I know I've just gone on to, to doing this, which I will do in a minute with some carving, um, I'm just gonna put a uh, something like at about the third point, some sort of 
detail there to give me some zones uh, to break it up. Uh, just a little little cove. Uh, you've got to be careful doing this because it's quite easy with a little tool to for it all to get rather exciting rather quickly. Um, it is quite deceptive the lighting here, you know. It's quite hard to so just run down on the one side and then open the flute out and dress the bottom with it running on the other side. Uh, so I've just got a little dividing line there. Maybe I need one at the top as well just to just to give it a bit of definition. Okay, so I've got a bit of definition there. Um, hands up who hasn't got a Dremel. Everybody's got a Dremel, haven't they? No? Um, well. Um, well, this isn't a Dremel either, it's an Axminster version. Another gadget. Uh, Paul, if you can hear me, this is a Simon Hope. Um, it's gone again. It's a Simon Hope carving jig. Right, carving jig. We've all got one, haven't we? Very handy if you do any of this sort of stuff. Um, let me just see if I can turn that. Well, that's probably the best angle. The handy thing is, is you can lock it off. Dremel. Carving one. Done a bit. If that doesn't work for you, then you can use proper carving tools, which I have to say I quite like doing. I find my rubber mallet. Just a little V tool. Okay. Well, don't forget we started very late. So. There you go, carve, eight of them. Uh, so, as if by magic, you end up with, um, I would do some beating afterwards, uh, but you end up with some lines like this and some segments which you can then do some texturing in. So I'll do some texturing in a minute, but if you want a break for coffee now, okay. So 15 minutes. <laughs> so we've got two years worth of awards here to give out on So um, So beginner's first place in 2020 was Simon Armson. Oh, Simon. Thank you very much. There we are. Uh, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sickly smile. Stay put, there's a few more. Okay. That was 2020. This is also 2020. Okay, so the um, advanced first place was Justin Fowler. Now Justin's not here, Justin's so not here. Uh, I don't mind taking that and I'll sort out giving it to him. Yeah, okay, and the central off will be good. I'll do that, yeah, okay. okay. Right. Okay, so the master's first place, who also isn't here, is Jim Coos. So, um, I can't remember where Jim lives, but... No. Do you want to keep it for the moment? Yeah, okay. Okay, um... Unless anybody knows who wants to take it. No, I can do the same. This is Keith Sherwood trophy. 
for last year, for 2020. For 2021, we, we, didn't have we cancelled it. Yeah, we did. And this goes to Harvey Greenwood. Okay, so I'll take this one because I live very close to Greenwood. Okay, right here. Yeah. That's for Harvey. That's I'll let you do all that. I'll, I'll, I'll just do with the awarding handshaking bit. I'm much safer that way. So this is now 2021, and we're in first place. Jeff Kelly, Simon Armstrong. Hey! Simon. Yep. Yep. Another photograph? I'll try to look serious. Well done, man. man. Well done. Man. Go, go, go. Thank you very much. Bigger shelves are needed. I can take that because I'll see him sometime or other. Well done, Paul. Paul, well done. Well done, Paul. Right, the, um, the master's first place was Malcolm Cleaver. Oh! Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. So well done, Justin. So well done, Justin. <laughs> um, the turner of the year, he, um, by the way, Justin's already got his, he has actually got his t-shirt, very kindly donated by Keith Mosley, um, but he didn't get the cup. He's not actually seen the cup yet. <laughs> um, and the 2021 turner of the year is Simon again. Come oh, on, Simon. More and more embarrassing. Thank you very much. <laughs> so the instructions to Simon are, are that he has to negotiate with Justin so that Justin can have it for a couple of months to show his family and then, and then you, you, you keep it. And this is why you're not allowed to stay as a beginner. This is uh, Saw 2021. Invitational competition, Richard Orton. Well done, Richard. <laughs> Ooh. Oh. Oh. Saw, typical cheap stuff, you know. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Saw. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Barry, thank you for that. So, during the break, I uh, carved some of the demarcation marks. So I've got a Sabre um, carbide multi-tipped um, dinghy on here. You can get Sabre and Cutsel, uh, the two makes that I know of. This is just a way of creating lots of little... Uh, You have to hold it quite firm, as I just didn't on that one because I made a mess of it. So, you can create lots of different patterns with these uh, tools. I'll just change it for another one quickly. The, the Sabre and, and, and Cutsel tools are very good, but they're about 18 to 25 pounds each bit. If you buy the carbide ones, uh, you can get 30 for 10 quid or something. So uh, they're not anywhere near as effective, but they are still effective. Um, if you press too hard on these ones, they will burn. Uh, you can't do these symmetrical or asymmetrical, depending on what you want to trying to achieve. See slight burn marks. It's up to you what pattern you choose, if you choose any. 
you can also dance the piece around. Can you see that on the screen okay? So you don't need, don't need to do hyper accurate stuff, you can make a complete wreck of it all because the idea that these are a bit like a shield means that they are going to be damaged and distressed. So, distressed. Anything that's got a pointy thing on it, I will just rotate that a bit to make it easier for me to see what I'm doing. So, this is a countersink bit. So, a bit awkward, but it's just to try and make it so you can actually see it. So I'll get some little star shapes on there. Hold on. Uh, that's holding the bit fairly rigid in my hand. If you hold it loosely and bibble it, you get more random. Uh, this is uh, another type of countersink bit. You get a different pattern. Obviously this works better on a softer wood. See, that's got a, a triangular shape. That's quite funky, isn't it? I've got um, a saw blade here. Um, so I'm just going to hold that on. Might be nice. Phillips screwdriver. Very similar patterns to the counter sinks. Um, uh, this is what they call these star heads. Talk, thank you. They're quite nice because they get you get quite a deep punch. And uh, you can see that still. Yeah, so um, you can, you know, this is a, a regular screwdriver bit, straight shank, just a straightforward traditional one. Just creates different marks. I always think these just look like battle axes, basically. So you can play about with all your bits. Um, what else have I got that I can hit it with? Uh, basically, you, you go around your workshop and think, oh, what, that's quite fun, I can hit it with that. Uh, so, you can obviously use um, proper chisels uh, with different profiles in. A V-notch shape, that's the V1, the veining tool I was using earlier on. Then you can obviously just create little... get a sort of, now you either choose to try and do these hyper accurate or do them like I do, random, blah, 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 blah. and then that way you can say that it was intended that it be that way. Um, this is a, a very ancient um, dressmaker's tool uh, for putting patterns in uh, through your rice paper onto your um, And it just creates a very fine micro texture. And you know, if you go around consistently and try and make sure that at least you've covered it and it looks vaguely logical, the world is your oyster, really. Uh, I mean, Nick Agard does all this stuff, and even he says he's got loads of tools that his grandma gave him and all that sort of stuff that he uses. Um, the other thing you can do is uh, beat the shit out of it with one of these. So, here's my tool, it's a cog. So it creates quite a, an effective pattern. 
So you can use any of these, any of these ones. I'll use a tire mallet so it doesn't knacker the uh, knacker it completely. Uh, Again, you've got a texture in there that's not dissimilar to the and then you can have a go up doing a bit of colouring. So uh, let's take this out of there. And I'll try and put a bit, bit of colour of some sort around on the ebonise. You don't have to ebonise but it's quite an effective background to uh, a lot of colours like iridescence. I've got to try and finish this one properly at some point because I want to flog it at the Marlow Art Trail event on the 2nd of May. You're welcome to join me at my house. Uh, this one's not finished on the back. Uh, this is horse chestnut that uh, Colin sourced. Um, and I, I was going to use more of this but the figuring is sufficiently nice that I'm not going to colour that. I've got a couple of blanks that I did it with the intention of using them for today, but they were just the figuring was just too nice, so I'm just going to uh, leave them untextured. They might become a shield. I'm not sure yet. Um, yeah, while I'm on the business of things I've decided not to use, um, this was a, a chopping block that. Um, a friend gave it, no, that's a chopping block, yeah, you, it, sink insert, you know, where you uh, fits across the sink. And they've got grab handles on and groove. So I thought, well, I don't know what it's gonna come out like. So I don't know whether I'm gonna texture this or, or not. I'm gonna do a bit of texturing. I'm not sure I'm gonna do any coloring, because it just turned out really nice. So that was a bit of scrap that uh, they were putting in the bin because they burnt it. So I nicked it. Uh, so uh, this is a bit of Dale Rowney interference paint. Uh, there's a num number of interference ones, Joe Sonia, uh, these were one of the cheaper ones. Uh, the chestnut ones I don't get on well, too well with, I must admit, they are supposed to be the same, but they're more like a solid colour. So just a tiny bit, don't need much. Uh, I think I snapped the inside of my lid off. Uh, a few drops of flow medium. Uh, Just to soften it back a bit. And fairly stiff short brush or your fingers. Um, this is a fairly stiff short brush. Uh, okay. Need to just get some towel, which I forgot to grab. There's no magic to colouring, it's, you know, there's so much, so many different types of colouring stuff around. Uh, what's that done? Okay. I tend to find what works for me best is put it on, take it off, put it on, take it off. Uh, so that's highlighted the top which is what I was after you can use your fingers see why I've got the gloves on you can highlight the top or you can push it in depending on what you feel looks good or in with the black it's quite nice to leave a little bit of a little bit of each Just rub your fingers together to spread it out a bit that's a bit of a ready type stuff. <coughs> I'll do a little bit of bluey. Uh, you know with all these interference paints, they don't really show until you put them on. Because uh, they, they're white in the tube. Is it mica? Somebody intelligent? I think it's mica. That's in there that uh, brings it out. 
tiny little bit of this. Uh, where do I want that? Let's put that on the middle. After you've done all this and you've coloured it and you've got black over everything, you usually need to go back and define the interfaces by taking some of the black off with a, with a chisel. Um, that's gone in quite nicely. You can just see that glowing a little bit. So that's interference paints. Um, let's uh, do a bit of rub and buff, which is a wax. Um, this is pewter, it's a wax metallic. Uh, stuff about 14 pounds each tube, so it's not cheap. Uh, very effective at the covering that it gives you, though. It's gone everywhere. This is the sort of stuff that um, I think Nick Agar uses. If it goes into all the grooves and you don't want it in the grooves, then you can go back and beat the shit out of it. You can go around it. Spin it up a bit. So, and then you need to go back and work it in. I know it's a bit of a mess because I'm trying to do it quickly and not um, taking the time that you really need to do. But you can build up the colour, the intensity of it, just with little tiny dabs. And it depends on whether what you want to try and do is create a completely uniform finish or a finish that is quite sort of wrecked and blended. Um, and the good news is if you don't like it, you just sand it back and do it again. Uh, so you can build up the colour my well, latex gloves are very good for this. Getting a bit of a, a bit of depth to it there now. Um, this stuff dries quite quickly, uh, but as in all the rainbow waxes, chestnut and stuff, which I've got a load of in there, um, you let them dry and you can then buff them up and then you can, despite the fact that Terry Smart says you can't lacquer stuff with wax in, you can very successfully lacquer stuff with wax in. Um, so let's just try a bit of rainbow wax, one of the new ones. Um, now this is sold as a wax, that one's the one that's not open, so I'll, open, I'll use one that is open. Uh, what colour do we want? Blue, gold, green, red. What? Bronze? So it's a wax, so you can't mix it with anything. Yes, you can. Uh, take a bit out, shove it in a pot. In case you're not sure about it. Does it mix with flow medium? But it does. Um, you can make it effectively into, um, almost into a paint. So you can thin it down. I'm even mixing it with a bit of the interference that's in there. Uh, and then I'm gonna stuff some of that around in the, in the inside. Slow it down so that it catches. Colouring is literally like watching paint dry. <laughs> See what that looks like. Yeah, rub a bit more in. Get it in and then I'm going to take most of that off.
Sometimes it's a complete cock up. Other times it can just produce a bit of blending. They put a bit more red in there. A little bit of red left in there. Yeah. A bit of overlap with the red. And um, at this point, you're all getting bored and we're nearly time to pack up. That might even be a bit of the blue. I'm picking up just little tiny remnants. But you see, you see where it's going? It's building it up, isn't it? It's making it um, a little bit interesting. But for me, the thing is about putting it on, letting it set long enough and then taking it off and blending it. And it just brings out all the uh, pattern, doesn't it? And then you carry on till you're blue in the face. Pom pom. Uh, on the ones that are there, I've let them fully dry. I've burnished them a couple of times, make sure they're fully dry, leave it for a day or two. And then three coats of uh, acrylic lacquer, car lacquer, cheap stuff. Um, and uh, it, it can get a bit interesting when it can react if you've got a dollop of wax that you haven't actually blended in. Uh, but that's what those are. They've um, been... Uh, yeah, that's the same stuff. Bronze, iridescent, uh, Ujit, sorry. I'll come back up here so you know what I'm doing. Uh, and that these are... That's an overlay of the red um, is um, Inca gold, which is almost the same as the rainbow wax, even though they're completely described totally different. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, they're technically almost the same. Yeah, uh, the three different colours of that and a bit of the bronze. There's a bit of gold gilding wax in there as well and a bit of the bronze around the edge. And then it's all been lacquered up. Um, different holes, different details. Uh, I think, and sometimes less is more, so that one might be best just left with the outside being black, although I have bled over the edges a bit, so I'm probably going to need to do something just in order to, uh, to blend it in. But often, I know Stuart Farini always says more is less and less is more and more is great, but... Um, uh, I also find that you can uh, mobilise it again with a squirt of water. Always reuse your Mr. Muscle. I'll shut it so it didn't go everywhere. A little squirt of water allows you to just dress off anything that's in the way. If it's acrylic and the base layer of the ebonising has been allowed to go off, then you can usually get it off. Um, Maybe not always in this case, but yeah, most of it's coming off. Well, I can always go over it again with my gloves, and a, I'll just put some more on off my glove, uh, and a bit of black, just uh, to tidy it up if that's what I want to do. Um, so that my colouring, there's no rhyme or reason, to be honest. It's just whatever seems to look right. And here endeth the lesson for today. There you go. Five pound at the door for everybody, please. Uh, thank you, Zoom members. Uh, sorry it didn't work out so well. Hi.